Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. In my opinion, Jeremiah 31 is one of the most important chapters in the entire Old Testament and even one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. Today we're turning to Jeremiah 31. We're going to look at Jeremiah 31 and the new covenant that God makes with His people. And hello again, I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado, and you're listening to our study in the key chapters of the Bible. Today again, we're going to Jeremiah 31 and the New Covenant. Now, by now, we should know that God is a covenant-making God. A covenant is a binding promise that two people make with one another. And we can see God's promises going all the way back to the early pages of the book of Genesis. In Genesis 1 and 2, God made everything, including Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3, though, Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord, and God in his mercy promises that one of their descendants will one day defeat Satan and fix the damage that Adam and Eve have caused. Later on in Genesis 8 and 9, God makes a covenant with Noah that has two stipulations, one, not to destroy every person, and two, not to destroy the entire world with a global flood. Then in Genesis 12, God makes a covenant with Noah's descendant named Abraham, and through Abraham, all the world will be blessed. Later on in Deuteronomy 29, God made a covenant with Abraham's descendants, the children of Israel, that they would be his people and he would be their God. But the children of Israel keep on breaking that covenant. And so then as we've just been going through the history of the Old Testament, we have just seen just time and time again, they've been breaking that covenant with the Lord. And so finally in 722 BC, the Lord allowed the Northern Kingdom to fall and be exiled by Assyria. But that doesn't get the attention of the people of the Southern Kingdom. They continue to break this covenant with God and just march towards God's judgment, and they will eventually themselves be exiled in 586 BC. Now, we've been reading about this judgment for the last couple of months, and we've been seeing that in the midst of these prophecies of coming judgment, God has also been promising to make a new covenant with his people, one that is unlike the other covenants that God has made with them in the past. And so the first prophecy we saw the new covenant was back in Isaiah 42, where the Lord said that his servant would be the covenant. He also says the same thing in Isaiah 49 as well. And you can listen to those episodes that we covered about three or four weeks ago back in June. Uh, Now today, we're going to Jeremiah 31. And in this passage, the Lord gives even greater detail about this new covenant in verses 27 to 37. But before we get to those verses, let's just put this whole passage in its context. And so going into Jeremiah 31, the context for Jeremiah 31 began really back yesterday in Jeremiah 30. You might remember that yesterday we talked about how God promised to restore his people back to the land. Here in Jeremiah 31, we're now seeing God promises to restore his people back to himself. And so in verse 1, the Lord declares, At that time, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Glancing at verse 2, verse 2 talks about they will find grace in the wilderness, which, by the way, this word grace only appears eight times in the entire Old Testament, and here we're seeing it's going to be associated when God restores the people back to himself, and it's going to have to be by grace because it can't be by works. The people are too prone to fail. And so in verse 3, the Lord says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. You just see that everlasting love of God for his people here and how he draws them back to himself. Jesus says something similar in John 6, 44, when he said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. That word draw in John 6, 44 is essentially the same Greek word for draw here in Jeremiah 31, except Jeremiah 31 is written in Hebrew, but when it was translated into Greek, the translators use essentially the same word for draw in both those places. And we're just seeing here this underscoring principle that when God restores the people to himself, it'll be by this drawing grace where he draws them into fellowship with him. Well, going on, we see in verse 4 where he says, Again, I will build you, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel, and you will take up your tambourines and go forth to the dances of the merrymakers. And so here he does something in verse 4 that is physically impossible. He is restoring Israel's purity back to her, and with it will come joy and celebration. And verse 5 talks about this, the bountiful abundance of the land. And verse 6 talks about how people will rise up and, and want to go to this promised land. In verse 7, they will sing for joy. And in verse 8, the Lord will gather his people from the remotest parts of the earth, even, look at it says there, even the blind and the lame. And so that just is telling us that those who were unclean under the old covenant will be made clean and be embraced in the new covenant. 
in verses 9 to 14 also talk about the joy that they will have as they have this renewed fellowship with the Lord. Yet, let's pause and look at verse 15. Verse 15 says there'll be a weeping in Rama and the removal of Rachel's children. And that prophecy was cited by Matthew chapter 2 when Herod killed all of the firstborn boys in Bethlehem. Now verse 16 promises that they'll be rewarded and verse 17 declares that there is hope for their future. And so that's just a quick overview of the context here in Jeremiah 31. Now let's drop down to verse 31 in this passage here and see what it has to say to us about the new covenant. Look at verse 31. It says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And so this verse here is telling us this new covenant is going to start with Israel and Judah. God still has a plan for the children of Israel. Going on to verse 32, Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. And so this covenant, the new covenant, will not be like the old covenant where it's contingent upon our obedience because they broke the old covenant. Going on to verse 33, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so now we're seeing that the new covenant will be internal in nature. It will include God's law being written on our heart, and we will rejoice as the people of God. And finally, in verse 34, it says, They will not teach again each man to his neighbor and each man to his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And so everyone in this new covenant will know God with pure, sweet fellowship and obedience. Even children, anyone, will know the Lord with this sweet fellowship. So that's just a quick overview. Now let's pause and and just compare this covenant here to what it means to become born again. You just talk about being born again in John 3, and it's just a common term we use to describe God's people, the children of God. So Jeremiah 31 says in verse 33, that God will write his law in the minds and on the hearts of his people. And when a person becomes born again, they have a clear awareness of their guilt before the Lord. They suddenly see their need for God's forgiveness and they call out to him to be cleansed by their sins. Why? Because God has written his law on their hearts and they are grieved of their sins against the Lord. Second, verse 33 says that God will be their God and they will be his people. And when a person becomes born again, they begin to look at the world differently. They no longer want to be associated with a world that's under God's judgment. They want to be associated with the people of God who are under his blessings. And so they join a church, they gather with his people, they assemble together with him for worship. In verse 34, it says that those in the new covenant will know God. And when a person becomes born again, God is no longer some kind of distant idea. Instead, he's a very real personal presence in their life. Fourth, verse 34 also says God will forgive their sins. And those who are born again have a clear awareness that they have been forgiven of their sins, not with like a glib indifference to their sins, but with this sorrowful trust of a child who knows they have sinned and yet is grateful that their heavenly father has forgiven them. And so it's no surprise that we see these principles scattered throughout the New Testament, which is really just the, the term New Testament is even just a Latin way of saying new covenant. And so let's turn to some passages in the New Testament or the new covenant and just see how these principles tie together. Let's begin by going to Luke 22, specifically Luke 22 verse 20. Now, while you're turning there, let me give you some just kind of the background of this passage. It's probably familiar to you. Luke 22 is giving us this account of Jesus and his disciples as they're having the Last Supper. This is the last meal before Jesus has died, and this is a Passover meal. And a Passover meal had several symbolic cups throughout the meal that they would drink at certain times and say certain things. And in verse 20, Jesus takes the third cup, which is often called the cup of redemption or the cup of blessings, and he says something that's completely unexpected. This is off the script. He says in verse 20, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, that's complete shock. You might remember from our studies, again, back in Isaiah 42 and 49, that the Lord had appointed the servant to be the covenant. And here we're seeing what that means. The new covenant is ratified by the servant's life as represented by his body and his blood. And so as new covenant believers, every time we participate in a communion service, we are reaffirming our covenant with the Father through the body and the blood of the Messiah that was given for us. And so that's the message of the New Testament. Let's go to a couple more references in the New Testament, starting in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. If you need to pause the podcast, go ahead and pause it so we can just turn to that passage and look at it together. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul is just giving this thumbnail overview of his calling and his ministry. And he says, starting back in verse 5, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. In other words, his message is not his own. It is from the Lord who, verse 6 says, also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, what is the letter here and why does it kill? The letter here is just this outward conformity to the law and it kills because a person can obey those laws and still be a million miles from the Lord and not even know it. And so it's the spirit who gives us true spiritual life. Again, that's exactly what we see in Jeremiah 31. And in the next set of verses here in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul then goes on to explain how the ministry of the Spirit surpasses the ministry of the law. And so in verse 8, the ministry of the Spirit gives even more glory. In verse 10, the ministry of the law is fading away. And therefore now dropping to verse 17, there is liberty. And so there is liberty for those who are in the new covenant because the law is written on their heart and is a true law of the Holy Spirit, just abiding fellowship with the Holy Spirit who is holy and we walk in his holiness. Now, this is the same idea also in Hebrews chapter 8. This is just another critical passage about the new covenant in the New Testament. Now, we don't have time to just really go in depth into this passage here, but the basic gist is that the author of Hebrews is just answering this question, what do we do with the old covenant now that the new covenant has come? And so in verse 7, the author explains that the old covenant was not faultless and therefore needed to be replaced by the new covenant. Verses 8 to 12, you'll notice if your Bible is like mine, mine's all capitalized, meaning this is a quote from the Old Testament. And if you look, this is a quote from Jeremiah 31, the passage that we've just been reading. And so then the author says in verse 13, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to disappear. And so the old covenant is now obsolete and has now reached the point where now it can disappear. But how do we become right with God in this new covenant? Well, chapter nine then answers that question. And the first set of verses is just talking about how the old covenant laws were for sin, but they couldn't actually make a person truly innocent. But then in verse 15, it says, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And so now we are living in this days of this new covenant and God is offering to all people this covenant. He's offering to make a covenant with you and I, with all people in this world. And this is a promise that is sealed in the blood of his son. And if we enter into that covenant, God promises to give us, as we see here, eternal life. He promises to write his law on our heart and to be our God and we will be his people. When we accept that offer, when we enter into this covenant with him, we are agreeing to worship him alone, that he'll be our God and we won't look to anyone else or anything else for our provisions and that we will walk in his holiness as his people. And while we don't have time to look at the rest of it, the New Testament basically just is unpacking this, really answer this question, now that we're in the new covenant, how do we then live? All of the New Testament is really answering that question. Things like get baptized because we no longer want to be classed with the old people. We want to be classed with the people of God who are in covenant with God. Uh, take communion at church, um, not because there's anything mystical about it, but it's just a way for us to reaffirm that our fellowship with God is through the covenant, through the body and the blood of our Savior, uh, just walking in his holiness and obeying him. All of those things are part of what it means just to live out who we are as new covenant believers. And so the final question has to be, are you in this new covenant? Well, how do you know? Well, have you accepted God's offer to enter into a covenant with you? He has offered to make a covenant with you. You have personally an opportunity to be in a personal covenant with God. And so along those lines, is, is God's law written on your heart? Uh, do you live as a citizen of his kingdom rather than a citizen of this world? Have you been baptized? Do you take communion? Again, we enter the covenant by faith. And it is, so it's not that these things are works that earn us salvation, but these are the kinds of spiritual things that are a part of the spiritual life of a new covenant believer. And so if you're not sure if you're in this covenant, well, you can deal with that question right now. Right now, God offers for you to join in covenant with him where he will forgive your sins and embrace you as one of his own people. It's an offer for you to separate yourself from this world that you might live by his commands and live and walk as a citizen of his kingdom in covenant fellowship with him. And he offers to make this covenant with you. All you need to do is accept it. And you can pray to him right now and accept the offer of the covenant he is offering to you. Well, so much more could be said. We'll have to end things there. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll catch you tomorrow. God bless.